Scott Ritter, thank you for joining us. Uh, I was myself startled last Sunday when the news broke for the first time from the Russian Defense Ministry, but I kept a large pinch of salt uh, in case it wasn't uh, true. But then Victoria Newland confirmed it in front of the Senate just yesterday, didn't she? Well, she she confirmed that there were biological research labs. She um, did not confirm that there were biological weapons or biological warfare labs. But the uh, distinction between the two is uh, is sometimes a very narrow one. And the United States has for many years been walking a very thin line between what is permissible under the Biological and Toxins uh, Weapons Convention um, under Article 1 and uh, what is prohibited. And I think uh, when the when the data is shook out, we're going to find out that uh, what was going on in Ukraine uh, clearly falls in on the prohibited side. Uh, we know this from Robert Pope, the uh, director of the uh, the program uh, that that uh, the De- Department of Defense program that operated these labs. He uh, he gave a press conference uh, right at, right before the war started, where he was worried that the Russians might uh, turn off the electricity or somehow uh, bomb the power generation capability of these labs, saying that the uh, samples that are there, the pathogen samples, which are frozen, uh, would thaw out. And then if the facility was damaged, they would be released. Um, And that's a legitimate worry. But then he went on to say something that I wish Marco Rubio had followed up with Victoria Nuland. He said, some of these facilities are newly manufactured. Some of them date back to the Soviet biological warfare period, meaning they are biological warfare facilities. And he said, scientists being scientists, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that some of these scientists preserve the very weapons they were working on. So yes, these are literally biological warfare facilities because they store, they have retained um, samples of biological warfare agent that have no use in any preventive uh, biological research, uh, defensive biological research. They can only exist if somebody seeks to replicate them in the future as part of a reconstituted biological weapons program. So uh, it's a little snide to say this, but Russia has succeeded in Ukraine, where the United States failed in Iraq by invading a country with a viable biological warfare capability. Yes, uh, it's one of the great ironies. Uh, No WMD in Iraq, just a million dead people, just ISIS and Al-Qaeda cascaded around the world, just a grand canyon of hatred opened that will never uh, be closed. Um, And there were no WMD at all in the end. Let me move on, if I may, to uh, tax your uh, military um, background and your military knowledge. I said, uh, and I'd like your view on it, uh, that uh, Russia has been fighting this war with one hand deliberately behind its back. If it had wanted to, it could have uh, flattened every city in Ukraine in the way that we did in Iraq in 2003. Am I right about that? Yes, I have to admit that um, when Russia initiated this action, I was one of the people that believed that they would use their doctrine in in pursuing their military objectives, and that is to combine overwhelming firepower, that is massed artillery strikes, which literally devastate the area in front of them, followed up by massed armor assault through that area, penetrating and moving on and repeating as necessary, literally destroying everything in its path. And this is a military that's fully capable of doing this. And I was a little shocked when I saw that they weren't. And you know, two things. One, we have um, Ukrainian friends who are very anti-Russian, but they have family back in Ukraine who they, of course, call back to check in on. And early on, uh, their family members said, oh, the Russians are here. And they said, well, how's it going? Are they you know, brutalizing you? And they, no, they're very polite. They uh, they're they're very polite. They 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 say, please just live your life. They let us fly the Ukrainian flag. Uh, they just say, get out of our way because we're going to accomplish our mission, but we don't want to interfere with you. We don't want to do anything. And then she said a couple of days later that the Ukrainian forces had counterattacked, taken advantage of the Russian softness, 
push the Russians back. She said the Russians refused to defend in the urban area because they didn't want to cause civilian casualties. Um, and then I listened to a Russian general, and he said, in Ukraine, we are using the Syrian tactics. Now, many people in the West will say, aha, I knew it. That means they're going to bomb Aleppo into the dirt. The Russians didn't bomb Aleppo into the dirt. What the Russians did do is work with the Syrian army to surround urban areas where these jihadists had been gathered, terrorizing the population, surround them, and then give them the opportunity to evacuate on buses with their security guaranteed by Russian military police. A soft approach that protected civilians, protected civilian areas. And the general said, we're doing this. And he said, we have paid a heavy price for this. We, you know, we, he said, well, we have destroyed the Ukrainian ability to fight a cohesive battle, meaning divisions coordinate with divisions, etc. They still have the ability to operate on the battalion and brigade level, and they are cutting off our convoys. They're killing our boys uh, because we're coming in soft. To give you an example, in Kharkiv, Kharkov, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, Russian Spetsnaz went in with the intention of negotiating uh, their way through. The uh, deputy mayor who met with them was assassinated by the Azov Battalion for collaborating, and the 15-man detachment that had been sent in there was surrounded and annihilated by the Ukrainians, who were fighting in an urban area. And people say, well, why are the, why are the Russians bombarding residential areas in Kharkov? Um, you know, they're, they're protecting so because the Ukrainians are dug in there. They're dug in there. They're putting their equipment there. And now Russia has taken a pause. And the feeling is, and I think I've heard a Russian general say this, that they're giving the Ukrainians one last chance to bring this thing to an end. They've, they've confronted the Ukrainian government with a fait accompli. <laughs> the Ukrainian government knows they've lost. Anybody, anybody who isn't paying attention to the propaganda knows Ukraine has lost this fight. Now it's just down to the bitter, bloody end. It's like when the Russians crossed the Vistula and came up to Berlin. The Germans had lost, but they still fought a bloody battle for Berlin that cost both sides a lot of lives. So there's still a lot of fight left in Ukrainians, but it's fighting in support of a lost cause. If the Ukrainians refuse the Russian offer, which I believe Lavrov will make tomorrow in Turkey, um, the Russians are coming in hard. Not that they're going to try and target civilians, but it's gloves off when it comes to the Ukrainian military. They will, because up until now, the Russians have treated the Ukrainian military as their Slavic brothers, meaning we understand you're resisting us, we understand you're defending your country, um, but we don't want to slaughter you like we could. Well, that's over. And I think what we're going to see in the days to come, if Ukraine doesn't capitulate according to Russian terms, is a completely different battle where it will literally be hell on earth for the Ukrainian people and for the Ukrainian military. And as somebody who has studied the Russian way of war, I don't wish that on my worst enemy, unless, of course, they're neo-Nazis or jihadists. Um, how likely is it that uh, in Turkey agreement will be reached in your view, Scott? <sighs> You know, that it's 50-50 at my point, because I've, I've listened to Zelensky speak, and he's all over the map. I mean, he's literally a bipolar individual. But on occasion, he's, he will say things such as, um, why would I ever want to be a member of NATO? They've betrayed me. Why would anybody want to be a member of, a member of NATO? They've betrayed me. So maybe I would accept neutrality if I could get you know, written guarantees for my security, which, of course, Russia will give them. So we know Zelensky uh, is going could is capable of at least talking about accepting that term about Donbas, the Lugansk and, and Donetsk. He said, "Why do it's just a, a poor poll mine? Why do I want that? G give it to them. Give it to them." So he seems to have accepted the, um, the 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 notion that those are independent entities now that'll never again be part of Ukraine. On Crimea, he said, "I'm open to discussing." something that respects the will of the people, like a referendum that he participates in. And if that's the case, they'll vote to be independent. He'll accept that. So it appears that there is the potential of this, but that's whenever Zelensky gets away from his handlers. Then Zelensky is brought back in, and people need to understand this. He is being managed 
by a CIA MI6 conglomerate. And you and I have talked about in the past what MI6 did with Iraq, Operation Mass Appeal, that information operation uh, where they planted information, psychological warfare, to try to create a perception in the British public conducive to supporting the war in Iraq. Well, the CIA does the same thing, and they're doing it right now. Where do you think the, uh, the 13 brave defenders of uh, Snake Island came from? CIA wrote that. Where do you think the ghost of Kiev came from? The CIA wrote that. We know <laughs> the New York Times, or I forget who reported, maybe uh, Associated Press or somebody, was honest about the, uh, the, the I don't need a ride, I need ammunition line that Zelensky is now famous for. Nobody ever quoted him. They quoted an unnamed U.S. intelligence official who quoted Zelensky. I mean, that was the most honest anybody's been. And then this ridiculous speech he gave to the British Parliament, uh, you know, bringing up Churchill, bringing up Henry V. Uh, you think Zelensky wrote that? No, that was written by his CIA MI6 handlers. And the sad thing is the British Parliament allowed themselves to be debased in that fashion. Here is the, one of the oldest institutions of democracy in the world. And it allowed itself to be used by its own intelligence service to spread propaganda, to propagate a lie. Shame on the British parliament and shame on the British people for allowing this to happen. Just like I say, shame on the American people and the American Congress. But I mean, at least we haven't been used it. Well, we did, I guess. Uh, Zelensky spoke to the US Senate the same way. So yes, we're both guilty of having our various democratic institutions um, be humiliated by being nothing more than a pawn for their respective intelligence services. In America, this is Yes, uh, a clack, uh, 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 clapping like seals. The last time I saw a standing ovation in the British Parliament, I was there, and the only one not standing was on the day that Tony Blair left office as prime minister. He put his pen down on the dispatch box, made to walk out for the last time, and the entire assembly stood and clapped like seals. Um, they're not clapping now about uh, Tony Blair and the Iraq war, and the Iraqi people certainly are not. Uh, a couple of other things, because of your expertise, if I may. Uh, the uh, presence now in Ukraine this day of Islamist fanatic, throat-cutting, head-chopping, uh, Islamist fanatics brought from Idlib through Turkey. Uh, why would they do that? And what are the dangers of them having done so? Well, first of all, you, you can judge. Uh, let me give you an example by answering this way. There's been a lot of propaganda that Russia has uh, brought in mercenaries, uh, the Wagner Group, and that Russia was going to bring in Syrian fighters. I can tell you with absolute certainty that the Russian military, which is one of the most professional militaries in the earth, it doesn't mean they're infallible, it doesn't mean they can't make mistakes, but they're professional. Their officer classes are some of the finest trained military professionals in the world. They would never allow mercenaries to fight alongside their soldiers. They would never allow in, 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 in a Russian operation in Europe to allow uh, Syrians to, to join them. Why? It will diminish their combat capability. Uh, they train to fight with each other. As soon as you bring in the Syrians, uh, the Syrians can't do what the Russians do. There is a decrease in combat effectiveness, and people die. So Russia would never do this because they're military professionals. What has Ukraine done recently? A, they've given out 25,000 weapons to civilians, um, which is stupid. Uh, if, if you've ever seen the movie Downfall about the Battle of uh, Berlin, there's a scene yes. in there where General yeah. Trump uh, responsible for the professional German defense of the city is watching the Volkssturm and the, and, the, and, the, and the Hitler youth run through the street and get slaughtered. And he's basically saying, why are they here? They can't fight. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know any concept of fire, cover, concealment, etc. And he went and begged to take them off the field of battle. Himmler, of course, said no. But Zelensky has given weapons to civilians who will literally be slaughtered if it comes time to fight. He has freed prisoners from prison to fight. He has opened the door for illegal warriors, the, the, the mercenaries from Europe, who, if are captured by Russia, will more than likely be given a cursory trial, put up against the wall, and shot because 
They have no rights or protections. They're the worst kind of scum, the exploiters of conflict. And now what does Zelensky's government do? They brought in the jihadists. They brought in the people because they ostensibly want to kill Russians. It's a pure propaganda move, but it's a poison pill. Not for Ukraine, because Ukraine's going to be destroyed. I, I doubt Zelensky's going to be able to come up with a peace agreement. And Russia has said if he fails to do so, it will be the end of the Ukrainian nation as we know it today. It, it will be destroyed. Um, but now we're going to have these jihadists who are being armed, by the way, with javelin missiles and stinger missiles. Now imagine what happens when a bunch of bloodthirsty jihadists take this, these weapons into Europe. Would you like to be the, 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 the German chancellor driving on a highway knowing that up in the hills could be a jihadist hit team armed with javelins that will take you out? Would you like to be the president of the United States visiting Germany knowing that up in the hills they're in? Would you like to be trying to land Air Force One uh, on, on, in, a, in, a, in an airport in Europe knowing that there's stinger missiles down there ready to shoot you down? This is literally the worst kind of decision making ever. A, to put that much weaponry into Ukraine in an uncontrolled fashion. Because even before the jihadists came in, you're giving it to neo Nazis who can't surrender. They can't surrender because they'll be killed, rightfully so. So, what do desperate people do when they can't surrender and they don't die? They run away with the weaponry they have. They'll be burying it, making caches, falling back on it, continuing a feudal resistance. And in their anger to the West, they'll lash out at the West and become you know, global terrorists. That's how global terrorism is born. This is literally the worst possible decision one can make, and it will have heavy consequences for years to come. Lastly, and you've touched on it uh, several times, uh, all the big uh, media organizations over the last eight years, the New York Times, CNN, BBC, uh, all, all the big outfits have reported on Ukraine's neo-Nazi problem. But suddenly they've all forgotten about it and it are averting their eyes from it. Uh, you're now a conspiracy theorist for drawing attention to something that they have all made programs about and written extensively uh, about. How big is the neo-Nazi slice uh, of Ukrainian political and especially military strength? Well, if we're, if we're going to be you know, dead honest, uh, it's, it's a minority. It's a distinct minority. Um, if, if left to normal political affairs, they would be struggling to get more than single digits in terms of voter support. Um, the problem isn't that you know their their role in a viable democracy. Their problem is the role they play in a state formed of violent revolution. Um, you know, in the Soviet revolution, uh, the Russian revolution, you had the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. The Mensheviks are the minor party. The Bolsheviks are the big party. But the reality was this was propaganda. The Bolsheviks are actually the smaller party. The Mensheviks were the bigger party. But the Bolsheviks, through violence of action were able to take control of the revolution. When the Maidan occurred initially, it was a peaceful demonstration against uh, the, 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 the Russian or the Ukraine, the pro-Russian Ukrainian president's uh, choice to move away from the European Union towards Russia. What happened is the United States and European Union mobilized this virulent nationalist group out of Lvov in Western Ukraine among whom were these neo-Nazis who worshiped Stepan Bandera and the, Band, uh, the Banderista movement, uh, which was a pro-Nazi Ukrainian national movement carried out a resistance in that area for decades. Um, these guys came in and took over Maidan, violently overthrew the, the, the legitimate president of Ukraine, and then imposed themselves through force of violence into the Ukrainian body politic. To give you an example of how powerful they are, when Poroshenko, who was the president before Zelensky, uh, negotiated the Minsk Accords in 2015, 2014, 2015, you know, he agreed that all they had to do is give a special autonomous situation to their status to the Donetsk and Lugansk, and they would stay part of Ukraine. He agreed with Germany and France. Then he came back and the neo-Nazis said, if you try and implement that, we'll kill you. Americans get upset with a bunch of rioters taking the capital and then leaving the same day. 
I get upset about it. I'm not happy about it. But the, it ain't an insurrection. An insurrection is what happened in Ukraine. It's happening every day. Zelensky was told he was elected to be the president who brought peace. If you remember, Zelensky toured the front line because they were supposed to disarm. And he went up to the Azov battalion and he said, disarm. And they laughed at him, kicked him out. He said, I'm the president of Ukraine. They said, shut up. We'll slap you. He had to leave. And he was told, if you sign Minsk, we will hang you by the neck until dead. That's the control these people have. And they've done it in the military. They, you know, these people should have been disbanded, arrested, shot. Instead, the military absorbed them and then promoted their officers throughout the ranks so that there's neo-Nazis everywhere. And the biggest embarrassment of all is when British, American, and Canadian troops go to Ukraine to train that military and NATO tactics, NATO equipment. The photographs show that they're training the Azov Battalion because those were the first units the Ukrainian military brought forward for training. We trained Nazis, literally. Unbelievable. Scott Ritter, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows.